Welcome to our fourth and final Legends of the Halls in this August series. I'm Diane Elstrom Devine, Development Officer with the Leadership Circles of Giving program here at the beautiful Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And we're so glad you've chosen to be with us this evening. Tonight's program, Iconic Landscapes, Preserving Nature with Diorama, was really the brainchild of our presenter, museum librarian and archivist, Terry Sheridan. Last year, Terry led a fascinating Leadership Circles behind the scenes walking tour focused on the architecture of the museum. At that time, she mentioned to me that she'd like to do a similar program focused on the art of the museum. Then with the pandemic shut down, we pivoted and Terry agreed to bring the art to us virtually. Thus, Legends of the Halls was born. Terry has been overseeing the museum's library and archives for the past 33 years, which includes approximately 23,000 titles in our library and archive materials dating back to the mid 19th century, including manuscripts, diaries, field notes, and photographs. And she plans on giving you a little background on her educational and professional journey, but I'd like to let you know a little bit more of personal insight. Although Terry is our museum librarian, she doesn't spend all her time inside and in the stacks. She's an outdoor gal at heart. She loves hiking with her dog Ruby on our local trails, is an avid camper, and enjoys cycling in her free time. She likes to refer to herself as an aspiring mediocre birder, but in this regard, sells herself short. Terry is a wonderful writer and ed editor and stands out as the authority on not only our library collections, but on the history of our wonderful museum. So with that, and it is my pleasure to introduce my longtime friend and colleague, Terry Sheridan, with Iconic Landscapes, Preserving Nature with Diorama. Thank you, Diane. That was very nice. Well, hello. I'm Terry Sheridan, and I'm lucky enough to hold the position of museum librarian and historian. I'm here to talk to you tonight about the museum's diorama art history, but first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I cut my teeth in the library world working in the Santa Barbara Public Library System while earning my degree in environmental science at UCSB. As I was finishing up, I was recruited by Associate Curator of Education, Mary Gosselin, to teach after school classes to four and five-year-olds at the museum. I discovered this whole world nestled in Mission Canyon that was filled with my people. I was hooked and when a library position opened up here at the museum, I left my job with Santa Barbara Public and forged ahead in the world of research. That was 1987. And I know what you're thinking. Good God, the woman has been there long enough to be a legend of the halls herself. Well, that may be, but someone else will have to tell that story. I'm just here for the art. So with that, let's get started. The museum has been a part of the Santa Barbara community now for 104 years. After that much time, the museum has come to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people and influence careers over time, but also a lot of memories. For those of you that have been around for a while, I'm sure you have some museum favorites. And if you've just recently joined our museum family, maybe you're still working on building memories. But I'll bet that many of you, whether you've been with us for years or just a few months, this button is among one of your museum beloveds. Right? The rattlesnake has been among our most popular exhibits for over 80 years. Created by Carl Miles in 1935 for a supposedly temporary exhibit on venomous animals, it's the one thing that repeat visitors ask about and seek, especially if they haven't visited the museum since childhood. The tiny woodland scene with the snake coiled among the rocks and leaves draws us in. And somehow that button just becomes irresistible. Diorama art, no matter how small, serves the purpose of giving context to the specimens on exhibit. For many museum guests, the realistic pairing of art and taxidermy might be their only close up encounter with animals inside their natural habitats. And in the case of our rattlesnake, well, 
that might be as close as you want to get. This evening, I want to review how diorama art first found its way into museum settings, and then about the people who brought that art to the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, and why it continues to be an important part of our museum today. The diorama background seed was paint planted with the panoramic art movement, which began in the mid 19th century as a means to document vast Western views. Artists were beginning to see rapid development of the American wilderness and panoramic painting was born as a method to document the wide landscapes before they disappeared. At the forefront of this movement was Thomas Moran, who spent his retirement years living right here in Santa Barbara. His paintings of the American West were highly regarded, so much so that this painting titled The Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone served as an instrumental evidence in convincing Congress to set aside this immense wilderness as America's first national park. Thus began an artist movement of land preservation through art. Because there were not many artists capable of working on the scale of Thomas Moran, the style began to wane by the end of the 19th century. Before it completely disappeared, however, natural history museums in Sweden, in Sweden and North America began picking up the art form to give context to their exhibits. Incidentally, this technique didn't really reach favor around the rest of the world until the mid 20th century. Among the first US museums to embrace this technique was the New York's American Museum of Natural History. Artists were challenged with adapting the panoramic style to fit on curved walls, forcing perspective so that the specimens in the foreground fit naturally into their painted backgrounds. Pioneering this technique at the American were museum legends Carl Ackley and Frank Chapman. The American's first exhibit hall containing landscape dioramas opened in 1902 to enthusiastic reviews. Prior to this, museum exhibition style around the world was much in keeping with the cabinet of curiosity method of objects under glass. Diorama was groundbreaking from the standpoint of the visitor being able to view plants and animals within the context of their habitats. Around the same time on the West Coast and especially California, we were claiming our own art movement. A number of studios focusing on landscape impressionism were opening up in both San Francisco and Los Angeles. Young professional painters working in the plein air style were taking advantage of the mild climate and varied landscapes to fill their canvases. Refugee artists of the great San Francisco earthquake were driven south after 1906, with many of them concentrating on the Central Coast. As more and more studios opened here, the Santa Barbara School of the Arts found its home in the Dominguez Adobe in 1920. The school, while best known for fine arts, also opened academies of dance, theater, and music. The list of artists in residence was impressive and included an association with the father of panoramic painting, Thomas Moran, along with an assemblage of some of the West's greatest 19th and early 20th century landscape painters, including the museum's founder and museum trustee, excuse me, the school's founder and museum trustee, Fernand Lundgren, his close friend, John Gamble. There was Carl Oscar Borg, Albert Herder, DeWitt and Douglas Parshall, Mary Wesselhoft, Frank Morley Fletcher, Thomas Moran, Edward Boreen, Colin Campbell Cooper, and Belmore Brown, just to name a few. Another early 20th century immigrant to Santa Barbara was egg collector William Leon Dawson. After amassing a collection of 5,000 eggs, representing over 500 species of birds, Dawson founded the Museum of Comparative Oology in 1916 in a pair of buildings adjacent to his home on Puesta del Sol Road. Dawson would, in 1917, hire another avid egg collector, Roland Gibson Hazard, but Hazard's appointment didn't last long. He died the following year. What Dawson didn't realize at the time was that hiring Hazard set the future course for this museum. You see, Roland Gibson Hazard was the beloved brother 
of Carolyn Hazard, who, along with Roland's widow Mary, volunteered at the museum to curate the eggs left behind their brother and husband, and then to serve on the museum's board of trustees. With the support of other trustees, they donated land and funded a new building at the museum's present site and set their goals on expanding the museum's mission to include all aspects of natural history. Mary Hazard, having a keen eye for design, took on the role of liaison between architect Lloyd Brewster and the trustees. But it was Carolyn who was the active patron of the arts and a close friend to several of the artists in residence at the school. Among them were Albert and Adele Herter and Fernand Lundgren, who she would recruit to the board of trustees. In April of 1922, the new building was unveiled as a memorial to Roland Gibson Hazard II. The name over the door with a font resembling eggs read Hazard Memorial Museum of Comparative Oology. On that opening day, when guests walked through the front entrance, they gathered in the still stark courtyard facing a prominently placed memorial tablet dedicated to Roland Gibson Hazard II. It was appointed with a simple terracotta frame and a white and blue kaolin basin molded by the historic Gladding McBean Company of Lincoln, California. These things were the first ornamental evidence of the Spanish Mediterranean style and fine details that were to follow. The relationship between the fledging museum and Santa Barbara School of the Arts had been sealed and the two hazard women were bringing their idea of an expanded museum punctuated with fine art into fruition. Influenced by both the panoramic art of Thomas Moran and the widening influence of North America's diorama exhibition style, Fernand Lundgren, museum trustee and president of the School of the Arts, had a vision for the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. It was his dream to present California birds against the backdrops of their native habitats. In 1923, he was instrumental in encouraging several of the school's artists and residents to accompany him into the field to sketch, then lend their brushes to the bare walls of our first bird gallery. That little bird hall was located in the courtyard building that now houses the museum's collection of gems and minerals. The first diorama to open in our bird gallery was painted by Carl Oscar Borg, Borg was born in Sweden and trained at the Société Internationale des Beaux-Arts in Paris. As a young man, he joined the Merchant Marines, then jumped ship in San Francisco where he opened his first art studio. After he lost everything in the 1906 earthquake and fire, he relocated to Los Angeles on foot, carrying his few belongings on his back by following the railroad tracks southward. Along the way, he met William Wendt and studied under him for a time. In 1914, Borg relocated to the Santa Barbara's Mesa. It was Wendt that encouraged Borg to involve himself in the newly started School of Arts in Santa Barbara. After his other cohorts, among his other cohorts were Thomas Moran and Edward Brain. He was teacher at the School of Arts from 1920 to 1924. The only photograph the museum owns of his diorama for the duck hawks, AKA peregrine falcons, is unfortunately too blurry to see the painted background. I imagine that it may have been similar to this Santa Barbara landscape painted by Borg around the same time. Borg is also well known for his depictions of Native Americans, Western lifestyles and luminous landscapes. Our written history tells us that Howard Russell Butler painted the background for our shorebird group. Unfortunately, our visual history lacks a photograph showing his work at the museum. Butler is recognized for his paintings of seascapes, landscapes, moonscapes, and particularly solar eclipses. His diorama art was also featured at the American Museum of Natural History, where his work graced the walls of the Hayden Planetarium for many years. Butler graduated from Princeton and had a law degree from Columbia, but followed his passion for studying art under the great Frederick Church. He moved to California in 1907, splitting his time between Santa Barbara and Pasadena. Butler also taught at the School of the Arts. 
Now, Cadwallader Washburn, he was a talented plain air realist that was also profoundly deaf. He managed at a time when services for the deaf were severely limited to graduate from MIT and the Art Students League in New York. He then went on to study the, at the Great Academy Julienne in Paris before settling in Morro Bay and Lone Pine, California. He painted the background for the Hall's Marsh Group Depicted here is Laguna Blanca at Hope Ranch as it looked in 1924. As we know, the lake is now surrounded by homes and streets. Well known for both his etchings and paintings of California landscapes, Washburn was on our board of trustees from 1923 to 1925. Interestingly, in 1928, Washburn, along with Norton Stewart, and this name will become important when we discuss the Mammal Hall, conducted a collecting trip to the Marquesas Islands under the auspices of the museum. While in the Marquesas, Washburn extended his stay to spend time with the cannibalistic tribe whom he taught to sign so that they could all communicate. He would later write that he was deserted by his travel companion at about this same time. Hmm, coincidence? Maybe. Harry Sheldon was hired by the museum as its first exhibits preparator. While he is probably best remembered for his game animal collecting, he was also quite skilled at both taxidermy and diorama art. Although he left the museum's employ soon after these two exhibits were completed, he was again contracted by the museum as a bounty hunter to help procure hoofed animals for a mammal hall during the latter part of the 1920s. Sheldon also collected specimens for UC Berkeley's Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. Now, Fernand Lundgren painted this background. He was a tonalist, meaning that aside from a few rough preliminary field sketches, he largely painted from memory in his Mission Canyon studio. He is another of our early artists that studied at the Art Student League in New York and the Academy Julienne in Paris. He is best known for his paintings of Southwest Indian tribes and glowing desert landscapes, of which the museum owns several. He's pictured above during a 1924 museum collecting and scouting trip into the Mojave Desert. It is written that this diorama was 21 feet long and five feet high. It was the featured diorama in this now defunct hall. We can only imagine the cool palette of pinks, purples, and sage greens that he likely applied to what we are only able to see in black and white today. Now the Mammal Hall was a gift of Santa Barbara benefactor and big game hunter Max Fleischmann in 1927. The exhibits didn't open all at once, but were added over a period of years as specimens became available and artists finished their dioramas. The hall today remains as a testament to the skill and passion of many of California's great landscape painters. Among the first exhibits to open in the hall was the Mountain Lion Group painted by John Marshall Gamble. John Gamble trained at the California School of Design in San Francisco and the Academy Julienne in Paris, where he was influenced by the great French Impressionist Claude Monet. Another artist who escaped San Francisco during the, following the earthquake Gamble is well known for his bright color palette and California landscapes often punctuated with wildflower fields. While a resident of Santa Barbara, Gamble served as a color consultant for the Architectural Board of Review and taught at the School of the Arts. The original Arlington Theater curtain was a huge panoramic landscape painted by Gamble and his starry night sky still graces the ceiling. Gamble and Fernand Lundgren were great friends and often traveled together on painting trips. Lundgren once noted, however, that Gamble's painting was far too bright and flowery for his taste, and Gamble was not known to paint the desert. Note the 1927 version of the background painting, painting in the black and white photo as compared to what we see today in the colored inset. In 1938, our mammals curator, Egmont Rett, had the foreground rock work enlarged to better frame the mountain lions and much of Gamble's beautiful background art was obscured. 
And this leads me to a few words about Egmont Rett. While he was known to paint a few backgrounds during his 40 year tenure, he was best known for taxidermy. Almost, almost all of the specimens in the mammal hall were prepared by Rett and his brother Arthur, as well as most of the birds that are still on exhibit in our bird gallery today. Rett was a master at his craft and sought after by museums up and down the West Coast, where his animal work can be found still standing sentry in many museums. And here's our bighorn sheep waiting for installation. And the tule elk with an unskinned, skin, boy, speaking, with an unskinned clay model standing in the background. And the California sea lion. Now the raccoon at Campbell Pond, which was once a wetland area north of Campus Point in Goleta, um, now covered with um, housing developments and businesses, and the spotted skunk dioramas are examples of Rhett's complete diorama work from taxidermy and vegetation to his background paintings. As a boy growing up in Colorado, Rhett trained under his artist father and worked at the Denver Museum of Natural History before moving to Santa Barbara. During our centennial refresh of the main campus, we wanted to emphasize the museum's relationship to its riparian setting and the ret dioramas of raccoon and skunk were replaced. Three, once separate windows were open to each other and the Mission Creek habitat was recreated in a background painting by Jan Vriesen. The finished diorama is a continuous view looking down Mission Creek capturing each of the animal specimens interacting within this dynamic habitat. And here we have background paintings by Norton Stewart. Stewart came to Santa Barbara in the early 1920s to build trails for the US Forest Service. His skills as a collector, taxidermist, and painter came to the attention of the museum and he was hired as an assistant curator and preparator in 1924 to replace Harry Sheldon. His educational background is sketchy, but there is evidence that he did graduate coursework at Oxford University. He painted local scenes for the backgrounds of both the black bear and the mule deer. Seen here are his views of Figueroa Mountain. During our 2018 refresh of the Mammal Hall, the badly damaged mule deer background was replaced with this painting of Pine Mountain, also painted by Jan Vriesen. Vriesen, a professional museum muralist, was conscripted by Dixon Studios for the job. Now we move to diorama backgrounds painted by Elizabeth Jordan. Betsy, as she was called, earned her degree in art from the State Teachers College located on Santa Barbara's Riviera. She was originally hired by the museum as a lab assistant and receptionist. While working in the lab, her painting skill was noticed by Norton Stewart, and taking her under his wing, he encouraged her to paint two of our dioramas. Of the two, it is the gray wolf background that stands, stands out as the most influenced by Norton's pointillist style. It is also the only background of hers that remains today. Soon after their completion in 1928, Betsy resigned her post at the museum and moved to San Diego to care for her ailing mother. And then this brings me to a little story. In September of that same year, with painters and curators still hard at work in our mammal hall, Los Angeles detectives had a mystery on their hands. The unidentified body of a woman had been discovered outside LA's Southwest Museum. Their only clue to her identity were the woman's shoes, handmade by H. Levi of Santa Barbara. Carrying the shoes with them, detectives traveled to Santa Barbara to interview the shoemaker. <clears throat> they learned that the shoes had been made for Elizabeth Jordan. Well, further events, investigation back at the Southwest Museum uncovered that Miss Jordan had met with a curator from the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History on the previous 
afternoon. Now, the museum's exhibit preparator, Norton Stewart, was wanted for questioning. Detectives again traveled to Santa Barbara. This time, their destination was the museum, where they contacted Mr. Stewart. Stewart told them of his rendezvous and meeting with Miss Jordan on the second floor balcony, the Southwest Museum. During the meeting, Betsy had told Norton that she wanted to return to Santa Barbara and the museum. She confessed that she was in love with him and she hoped that they could spend their lives together. Sadly, Norton didn't share her love and he told Betsy that this would be impossible as he would soon be leaving the museum to travel overseas for an indefinite amount of time. <clears throat> Remember that Marquesas trip? Detectives would later determine that a heartbroken Elizabeth Jordan took her own life with a pearl-handled revolver, falling over the balcony rail to the ground below. This tragic tale of love forsaken has a sad end for a young woman with promising talent. Today, the two dioramas painted by this pair contemplate each other from opposite walls of the mammal hall. Well, that brings us to our elk. Lila Tuckerman painted our backgrounds for this diorama. The scene is of a wetland tributary from the Kern River that once led to Buena Vista Lake in Kern County. Today, this area is under restoration after all of its water was diverted by dams and canals for farmland irrigation. The landscape, although drastically changed, was preserved here in Tuckerman's window from another time. Tuckerman was a student of the Corcoran Art Gallery in Washington, D.C. and mentored with George Noyes, Charles Woodbury, and Douglas Parshall. She married Wolcott Tuckerman in 1903 and migrated from the East Coast to Carpinteria in 1915. Incidentally, it was her husband Wolcott that donated more than 100 Bean Edition Audubon prints to the museum's art collections in 1923. Those Audubons make up the core of our Maximus collection of antique prints today. Well, Lila, she worked in both watercolor and oil and is well known for her landscapes, still life and murals. And one of her murals still graces the walls of St. Paul's AME Church located on Olive Street. An esteemed member of the California Art Club, Tuckerman repainted Buena Vista depicting a wetter winter scene for the museum's elk diorama in 1939, along with a new backdrop for the Coyote Group. We believe the Coyote background to be Gaviota Pass prior to the 101 freeway improvements. Only the elk diorama remains with us today. Art was not Tuckerman's only passion. An active advocate for the blind community, Lila was internationally recognized for teaching, writing, and translating Braille. Her mentor, Douglas Parshall, grew up painting under the tutelage of his father, DeWitt. He studied at the Art Students League in New York, the Academy Julian in Paris, and taught mostly portraiture at the Santa Barbara School of the Arts. During the 1930s, he supervised artists employed by the Federal Works Project, and today his mural work can also be seen at Santa Barbara Junior High School and the Warner Brothers Theater in Hollywood. Parshall is recognized for his landscapes, portraits, and depictions of horses. Active in the Santa Barbara art community for over 60 years, he was also a founding member of the Santa Barbara Art Association and painted with the Oak Group. His background for the museum Sea Lion is a view of Santa Cruz Island bluffs dropping into the sea. And then this brings us back to Fernand Lundgren. Dante's Peak in Death Valley was one of Lundgren's favorite places within the monument. Here has, he has recorded the view featured in many of his paintings. Our bighorn sheep diorama is perhaps one of the most striking di dioramas in the Mammal Hall, and it's my personal favorite. With bighorn sheep scaling the steep mountainside, Lundgren's painting draws the eye downslope clear to bad water on the desert floor below with a distant vista of the Panamint Mountains. It's really lovely. Now, perhaps the most diversified of our background painters was Belmore Brown. While still in his 20s, Brown established himself as a mountaineer, naturalist, collector, preparator, and illustrator. <clears throat> he died in 
He worked for the American Museum of Natural History and accompanied Andrew Jackson Stone on his epic collecting expedition to Alaska at the turn of the century. As seen in his photograph left, it looks like he's got um, some sort of bighorn sheep that he's collected. He made two ascents of Mount McKinley and uh, published his accounts in a book, The Conquest of Mount McKinley. And like many of his cohorts at the museum, he studied at the Art Students League in New York and the Academy Julien in Paris. Splitting his time between Banff, Canada, New York, and California, he took over as director of the floundering Santa Barbara School of the Arts in 1930. He is best known for his painterly portraits of wildlife, the Alaskan wilderness, and Rocky Mountains. In addition to his dioramas in this museum, his work can be enjoyed at the Boston Museum of Science and the American Museum in New York. In this pronghorn antelope diorama, he has painted a scene where the animals in the foreground gaze toward a distant herd galloping at the base of the Mojave Desert's Antelope Butte. For our grizzly bear, Brown captures a view from Oso Canyon in the Los Padres National Forest. And the harbor seal diorama shows a view from inside Santa Cruz Island's painted cave, looking out at the land and sea beyond. This large mural, painted over twice more, shows a view of the Figueroa Mountain habitat. It was first painted by museum artist in residence David Hagerbaumer for the Hale Hall of Botany in 1961. Hagerbaumer studied at art at San Diego State College and is best known for his intricate carvings of duck decoys, game bird portraits, and sporting scenes. A production artist, Hagerbaumer illustrated numerous books and periodicals, including artwork for Field and Stream magazine. After a devastating fire at the museum in 1962 stalled work on our bird habitat hall, Ray Strong was asked to paint the mountain scene for a second time while waiting for bird hall work to resume. Now, Ray Strong had been hired as a resident artist also in 1960 to paint 10 backgrounds for the museum's new bird wing. A child of eight, when he began painting Oregon landscapes, he was formally trained at the California School of Fine Arts and the Art Students League in New York under the tutelage of Frank DeMond. Before moving to Santa Barbara, he taught at the San Francisco Art Students League with Maynard Dixon painted dioramas for both the U.S. Forest Service and the National Park Service as part of the Federal Works Project and worked with sculptor William Gordon Huff to create UC Berkeley's prehistoric landscape for the Golden Gate International Exposition in 1939. His panoramic sized painting of the Marin headlands at the beginning of the Golden Gate Bridge Project have been, has been featured at the White House and currently hangs in the Smithsonian's American Art and Portrait Gallery. Of the original 10 dioramas painted by Strong, eight remain today. All feature Central California's landscapes. Ray was a co-founder of the Santa Barbara Art Institute, the Santa Barbara Art Students League, and the Oak Group. He was dedicated to the preservation of landscape and used his paintbrush as his environmental voice. The Desert Bird Group is a view of Antelope Valley in Mojave Desert. Against Ray's realist style and aesthetic sensibility, Egmont Rhett insisted that he dot the landscape with hundreds of Joshua trees. In reality, Joshua trees are few and far beyond between in this region of the Mojave. Ray added a few more trees to his painting and an unhappy compromise was met between the two. This slide is a view from Laguna Lake looking toward Bishop's Peak and following the volcanic cones as they march toward Morro Bay. Strong once told me that this was his favorite Central California coast landscape. This painting is where the scale was set for every diorama in the hall. Egmont Rhett wanted Ray to capture the top of Bishop's Peak in the painting. The only way to do that was to set the midline at only four feet, a whole foot lower than what was the norm. To retain congruent perspective throughout the hall, each of the other dioramas was lowered to the four foot mark. 
Because of this, the dioramas are best viewed while sitting on the benches provided within the hall. When one is standing in front of the windows, the view is much like that of a bird soaring into the habitat. And we have Kalita Beach. My favorite, and that's because when I was teaching after school classes, <clears throat> a five-year-old once asked me if we could walk out and stand on the island. As I squatted down beside him, I saw for the first time the magic of viewing these dioramas from the proper height. The things that we can learn from children. And this is Fraser Point on Santa Cruz Island. Of course, Ray painted each of the dioramas in the bird habitat hall. In addition, he captured the Carrizo Plains, Mount Pinos, Pine Mountain, and a dizzying view looking down onto the Sedgwick Ranch from an eagle's nest. Ray Strong lived to be 101. In his sunset years, his caregiver used to push his wheelchair into his, quote, cathedral for the birds, where he'd pull out his harmonica and play, the bear went over the mountain. I would sometimes get up from my desk and walk over to the hall to listen to his serenade, then greet him and hope that he might have some stories to share. Marilyn Griffith was a talented commercial diorama artist and museum volunteer married to one of the museum's research associates, Roland Griffith. After the 1962 fire damaged the Marine Hall, she donated her time to paint this shoreline view of Coal Oil Point in Goleta. Her husband, an expert in plastics, helped to appoint the hall with many of the molded fish and invertebrates that cling to the rocks and swim through the fabricated sea. Most of her dioramas can be seen in Palm Springs and San Jose. Santa Barbara local Larry Iwerks lent his brush for a refresh of the little dioramas in the Chumash Hall in 1980. The foregrounds, still extant, were built decades earlier by artist Elizabeth Mason. Iwerks is a third generation artist from a family made famous by the Disney Studios. His grandfather, Ub Iwerks, created the Steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse. Larry Iwerks studied at San Francisco State University, the Mendocino Art Center, and at the Santa Barbara Art Institute under Ray Strong. Iwerks art has been featured in the touring exhibition, Art for the Parks to Honor Our National Parks, and he was asked by the George W. Bush administration to paint an ornament depicting Channel Islands National Park for the White House Christmas tree one year. An active member of the Oak Group, Iwerks owns the Weldon Gallery and teaches oil and watercolor technique. His work is often featured in local galleries. Here we see a view in the San Inez Valley and a Chumash village set against the bluffs at a royal borough. The museum hired another member of the Oak Group, Richard Schloss, as artist in residence in 1991 to paint murals for our Cartwright Interactions Hall. Schloss earned his Master of Fine Arts from UCSB where he fell in love with the light and color that is unique to this region. That was the reason enough for him to stay here after graduation. Schloss has painted with the Oak Group since its founding in 1986. His depictions of local landscapes inside the Cartwright Hall flow from Figueroa Mountain down to the Carpinteria Marsh. Sloss is locally known for his masterful plein air and his regular exhibitor in local galleries featuring landscape art. Sloss accompanied museum scientists, educators, and exhibit staff into the field to experience and paint the very locations where insect collections were being made. Not only was he able to capture each locale at a single moment in time, he was able to create accurate habitats to add context to the plants and insects on display. Here is the Carpinteria salt marsh. The Cartwright Interactions Hall, which opened in 1992, was a combining of the museum's original Hale Hall of Botany and the Campbell Insect Hall. To give continuity to the Santa Barbara landscapes presented within, Sloss was asked to paint the large background of Figueroa Mountain Diorama for a third time. While making field sketches, he also captured this view from the top. After 100 years, the 
the museum embarked on a refresh of the campus. The Sloss dioramas were preserved for our new Santa Barbara Gallery, which opened in 2018. We'll continue to hold tight to the master art in our halls, for it is the background of our regional interpretation. We want visitors to experience landscape within the context of their own interactions with the environment. Inside spaces guide guests to a greater understanding of the planet's outdoor spaces. Many years ago, a sign hung alongside our front walkway that read, study nature here, enjoy it everywhere. A sentiment that we still hold tight to today. Thank you for listening to me this evening. And I guess we'll see if there were any questions. Thank you so much, Terry. Really fascinating. Our museum's connection with the art community certainly runs deep. We do have a few questions for you if you're up for it. Um, sure. Actually, we had a couple that uh, were very similar, and that is, are most of these dioramas done in oil paint? Mm, yes, they are. Um, and uh, I think that that's because oils tend to hold up best over time. And, um, what were the dioramas painted on and could they be moved from place to place? Um, that is actually a really good question. Um, the dioramas have not really been moved from place to place and it has varied um, in terms of technique and um, the artists themselves in terms of what they were painted on. Our bird habitat hall, for, for instance, uh, the, the dioramas are painted directly onto the plaster walls. So there is no way to really move them at all. Um, the thin plaster makes them sort of like as though they're giant potato chips. Um, so, so really, really pretty fragile. And um, it's, it's been a trick to preserve them through the years. Um, our mammal hall, some uh, have been painted on canvas and then applied to the plaster. And incidentally, the um, new mule deer diorama um, was painted off site and then applied on to um, the old, applied over the old mule deer diorama so that that diorama could be preserved at some future date should the museum want to embark on that. There was a comment made earlier on about uh, someone being bothered by taxidermy. Um, and knowing that some of the animals were found dead, but what about others? Do you have any comments related to the taxidermy issue? Um, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of comment. I mean, if we want to be able to display things for people to learn, then um, the way that they were collected uh, was by going out and, and, and shooting the animals often. And um, Gosh, we don't really do that so much anymore. Uh, now we procure animals through um, fishing game when there's been a death or sometimes animals have been hit. Um, but back in the day, uh, they, were, they were shot. So that's the only comment I have towards that. Fair enough. Sorry, folks. <laughs> uh, let's see, we have a question. Speaking of preservation, are there regular applications of a preservative over the mural? Um, no. We have had um, conservationists come in and do restoration work on some of the backgrounds through the years. We had extensive work done in our mammal hall in um, the early 1990s, for example. We've had work done on the strong dioramas. Um, and actually, very recently, we had some damage to uh, the Goleta Beach when a pipe that ran through the ceiling decided to leak and damage the ceiling and some of the, the work below. So um, when that happens, we bring in conservators and they very carefully do touch up um, without trying not to damage what's already there. Victoria wanted to know, is there a historical or other reason why so many of the artists attended the Art Students League in New York? 
Yeah, that is very interesting. Um, it was one of the most prestigious schools um, for art in the United States during that early time period. Um, and so I think anybody who was really serious in art and the study of art tended to head off to New York to do that. Um, the, the Academy Julien in Paris too is sort of interesting because it was um, a place where a lot of American artists tend to go and study. And I think it was um, kind of sort of catered to that and um, speaking French wasn't required to be able to study there. Are there any of the now lost murals anywhere in storage? Um, yes and no. Uh, in terms of the, the murals that were part of that little bird gallery, no. Um, and gosh, I don't know if they were preserved someplace and hauled off site or if when they, that hall was redone, they were just demolished. So have no idea what happened to them. There are three Ray Strong uh, canvases that are um, in storage here at the museum. That kind of leads to one other question. Does the museum have any original paintings besides the dioramas in its collection from the, some of the artists that you mentioned tonight? Yes, we do. Um, we have paintings by Fernand Lundgren and we have paintings by Ray Strong. Um, gosh, I think our partial is actually DeWitt. So those may be the only two. Oh, actually we have a painting, an unframed painting by Richard Sloss as well. Well, I think we've gone through the majority of the questions, Terry. My thanks again to you for your insightful journey into the history of the museum's diorama art and artists. Uh, once we are able to open our interiors again, I know we'll all be visiting our galleries with a new appreciation. If you'd like to contact Terry with additional questions or comments, please feel free to email her at tsheridan at sbnature2.org. And to all you museum members out there, thanks again for joining us and thank you for your continued and generous support of the museum and the Sea Center. We hope you'll come visit soon and please let your friends and neighbors know that the museum and the Sea Center outdoor spaces are open. We hope you've enjoyed our Legends of the Hall series this month. We've wanted to look back while keeping hopeful for the future. If you have any legends topics you'd like uh, us to look into for some future legends of the halls, please let me know. We are considering doing a few more down the road. And don't forget, you can always stay connected with the museum and Sea Center on our website at sbnature.org. Thanks again, and on behalf of myself and Sarah and Terry, stay healthy and stay hopeful. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye, everybody.